Welcome back to the Worthy Woman Podcast with Aston Simmons. Today I have a very special guest. My husband, Adam Simmons, is here to chat with us today. And we're going to be having a really deep and vulnerable conversation with you. We are going to be talking about dealing with mental health issues in a relationship. Now, this is something we've personally had to deal with. So we're going to be speaking from our experience, what has helped us through this. Um, we're going to be sharing with you five really simple tools that you can use to help yourself and your partner deal with mental health issues in your relationship. It is definitely something that is becoming more and more common um, in relationships as the world changes, as the stress increases in the world. So it's really important that we have these conversations and it's really important that we share our experience with you because mm. we want you to know you're not alone, that it is so normal to have challenges in your life and in your relationship. And the only way we can normalize that is by being vulnerable and sharing our experience. So yeah. we are really um, excited but nervous to have this conversation. It's the first time we've shared publicly about the, um, the mental health challenges and issues that we've had in our relationship, but it feels like the right time and it feels like we're ready to have this conversation. So yeah. thank you so much to my gorgeous husband for coming on and having this really important chat. My pleasure, babe. It's good to be here and especially with, a, I think, Are You Okay Day coming up, I think mm. it's the perfect time, as you mentioned, um, to have this chat. We know a lot, a lot of other couples are having similar issues and a lot of people don't want to talk about it. Mm. And so we thought it was time to, to talk about it and I guess, so you guys can see that we're, we're no different to, to you and we're all having these same challenges and the only way to work through it is to talk about it yeah, um, and get it out on the table because that's how we begin to process what's going on underneath. Yeah. So I think we want to start with sharing a little bit about our experience with mental health issues and how it's showed up in our relationship. So wow, I was like thinking about before we went live, like thinking about how many different challenges or dark nights of the soul or whatever you want to call it, we have been through together mm. because we have been together 20 years next month. I can't yeah. believe it. Um, yeah. And married for nine years. So there has been a lot of evolutions, a lot of challenges. We've gone through a lot. Um, but in particular, I would say in the last five to seven years, I think it's become more apparent that there has been some mental health issues for you mm. that we've had to learn how to navigate in our relationship. Mm. And so I think I want to start with sharing about sharing about that journey for us and, and where, um, you know, how we kind of identified there was even a mental health issue going on for us. Because mm. I think today sometimes people think, you know, yeah, life is hard. Like it, it's normal to experience all these different emotions and go through all these different challenges. But I know sometimes you can be in it and you can actually not be aware that maybe you are experiencing some anxiety or depression. Um, and that happened with, with Adam several times um, mm. throughout our journey because, you know, you were new to understanding your emotions and how you were feeling and... Mm there were several times that I intuitively knew that Adam was having mental health challenges, that he was, you know, experiencing anxiety or mm. depression, but it was difficult because you weren't really outwardly sharing or yep. maybe even weren't even fully aware that that's what you were experiencing. Mm. Because again, the second part of this is this, although it's not a new thing, it's kind of a new conversation to be sharing and, you know, there's another layer of men not always feeling safe to share that they have things going on inside. Mm. You know, they suppress so much. Mm. So maybe do you want to start by sharing that journey for you and how you mm. kind of got to that place of acknowledging first in yourself that there were some mental health challenges mm. um, that you were experiencing. And then really how we opened it was to then 
start to have conversations about it and we'll go into the the five um, tools or the five steps that we learned um, and that we applied in our relationship to help us kind of unpack those mental health issues together. Mm. Yeah, so I think it was it was something that was apparent for a long time. I mean, we're talking, it was really there from my early 20s, really, mm. if I'm honest, like going all the way back to entering the workforce and being in my early 20s and and, and really not, I didn't know, my emotional intelligence was zero, mm. basically. I didn't know what I was feeling a lot of the time. I was very disconnected from my own feelings. And so I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know how to express what was going on. I didn't know how to express my desires, what I wanted. Um, what you needed. <laughs> what I needed. Yeah. Um, so it was all very, all very external for me, just doing the things, going to work and ticking the boxes. And, and I think going down that road for a number of years, um, well, it would have been 10, 10 or more years, really, mm -hmm. just doing the same old things. All of those emotions and all those things that happened in that period of time just got, just built up. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't really until our second child, Willow, was born, which was about just over four years ago now, um, that all of it started to come to the surface. And it, it got to a point where it was so bad that I couldn't ignore it anymore. Mm. Um, I was waking up in the morning and I was, I was depressed. I didn't want to get out of bed. I was dreading the day. Um, I had very little energy. I was anxious. I was worried. Um, just a horrible place to be. Mm. And I didn't have any answers. I didn't know what the next step was. Um, and I went through, sort of just carried on feeling that way for, it was probably a couple of years really, mm. you know, probably prior to Willow and even, even going a couple of years into after she was born, um, of just putting up with it and not really seeking help or seeking answers. Mm. And it wasn't until this gorgeous woman here, um, really started to, Aston's always supported me from, you know, the moment we, we got together. She's always been there as a, as just one of those people that's just like a beacon of light, always there to help and support and guide. And, and that's what she does with everyone in her life. And that's why she's, she's such an incredible coach. And, um, but I think it was her that really helped to initiate the changes that needed to happen for me to then work through some of the stuff that was under the surface. So I think the turning point was really um, when we sat down, you, you suggested that we got some cacao, some ceremonial grey cacao, and we sat down and maybe just had some intentional time together of an evening. And, and at first I thought it was a bit of a joke. I was like, okay, well, we're going to drink hot chocolate and sing Kumbaya and it's all going to magically be better. But this is a typical thing that I see too with men. They don't, they don't see the significance of just intentional time mm. together with their partner. Um, and that's all it was. It was just time where there was no distraction, no TV, no phones. It was just us looking into each other's eyes and holding a safe space. And we'll go into more into that in a minute, but having a safe space where I could really acknowledge everything that was coming up for me, how I was feeling. And Aston was just there to witness that, not to fix. And, and me for her as well. She was expressing what was going on for her and I was there to just listen and, and understand what, was, what she was feeling as well. And that was the turning point. So we did that for about a year, actually almost every night we sat down and just talked, listened. Um, there was no fixing it. There was a couple of rules about the space that we created there. Um, and, I think and it was that really healing. You. It did, I think yeah. underneath it, I think part of the problem for me was I, and this is hard for a man to say, but I didn't feel safe to express everything that was going on for me. And a lot of men, when you say, oh, do you feel, if you ask them, do you feel safe? The, the automatic reaction is, oh yeah, of course I feel safe. Men typically. Um, it's like you felt physically safe, but not emotionally yeah, safe. Yeah, I think that's, that, I think that's yeah. the, dif yeah, the, the distinction. distinction between yeah. the two is, um, I didn't know what emotional safety was. Mm -hmm. But once that, once that space was there and I felt like I could bring it up and it wasn't going to be, um, you know, wasn't going to be made wrong or, or judged, judged or, or shamed or for bringing it up, yeah. then um, yeah, it was really transformative. Mm. A lot yeah. came up in those those chats that we had over that, that 12 month period. Yeah. 
and it, it started me on a journey to take the next step and the next step and the next step. And part of that was getting a coach. Mm. And that was really helpful. And then I started to read different books and got other mentors and, and it all just led on in a beautiful way to, to more and more growth. It was really uncomfortable, mm. but at the same time, it was exactly what I needed. Yeah, wow. I wasn't expecting for you to acknowledge me like that, so sorry. I went really quiet because actually brought up a lot of emotion. Um, and you know, it was it was hard. It was really hard. I'm going to be completely honest. It was really hard watching you go through that and knowing that you were not in a good place. And I had tried lots of other ways to help you that did not go well. So. I see women all the time and I don't judge you because I did the same thing and I know you're scared and you're hurting and you're worried. And when your partner is in a dark place and they're um, having mental health challenges, it can be so hard because you can't see it on the outside. Mm. And, you know, other people can look at you and think, oh, they're doing great. Like, what's the problem? They're mm. fine. But when you're in a relationship behind closed doors, you see what's really going on. And that can feel like a load, that can feel like a big responsibility. And I know that especially with two young kids, um, you know, that time was a really challenging time. And I was, you know, trying to be the best mum I could be, but also trying to learn how to support you through something. And, um, and it was really hard and harder because I felt so alone in it. Like mental health, can be really lonely for the person who's going through it, but it can also be so lonely for the person you're in a relationship with. Mm. Because during that time, Adam was um, distancing himself from me a lot. He mm. was, because he didn't know what was going on with him, he he was pushing me away mm. and, and shutting me out or trying to make me wrong or the problem. And yeah. luckily I had the tools and the awareness um, to see that and not to take it personally and to look underneath and that's what I really invite you to do if, if you have a partner that you know is having mental health challenges which they're not acknowledging which I must you know just validate that that's really hard it was really hard when I knew you had mental health challenge, challenges and you needed help but you weren't acknowledging it you know you can't do it for them and it was hard mm -hmm. um, so you know I had to really take good really good care of myself and then try and look underneath your behavior or underneath what was happening on the surface and look for the emotional need mm. underneath that wasn't being met mm. and when i did that it was very clear that you needed safety you mm. needed emotional safety and so that became my number one priority um, and I stopped doing things like saying to you, like, you need to get help and what's going on with you and what's wrong with you. Like, they're the worst things to say to someone who's mm. going through mental health challenges. Um, and But I also know that when you're frightened or you're scared or, you know, you don't, the other person isn't acknowledging it, it can be frustrating. So you can use, say things like that unintentionally. But if you can get curious about what the emotional need is underneath, and I think that's the key to what I did. I stopped playing on the surface. I stopped thinking about, you know, what you were doing or weren't doing, and I stopped criticizing or judging how you were dealing with it or not dealing with it because mm -hmm. you weren't. And instead, I got curious about what you actually needed underneath and how I could help you meet that emotional need. Mm -hmm. And that actually took way less effort and energy than what I had been doing previously, which yeah. was trying to get you to talk about it, like, you know, questioning why you weren't getting out of bed, like, you know, and, and really being like, what's going on with you? That did not help us get the answer. Mm -hmm. um, but creating that safe space, like you said, um, it just, I feel like it, it allowed a space for you to, to be validated in what you were feeling mm -hmm. and that it was okay that it was okay for you not to be okay and that I would still love you in that mm -hmm. and I would still love you through that. And I think that that is something that is missing from a lot of people's relationships today. Yeah. It, it takes so much courage and bravery to be able to sit in someone else's discomfort of, of things like dealing with mental health challenges and not take it on board 
and just hold that space for them. It takes a lot of courage because it was uncomfortable yeah. for you and it was uncomfortable for me. Yeah. You know, it, I didn't want to think of my husband having these challenges. I didn't want to think of you in this dark place in your head and feeling disconnected from life, disconnected from the family. Um, but, you know, my ego didn't want to face that, but my heart knew that I could still love you through that, that I could open to you and I had to get into my heart and open to you from that place. Mm. And it was incredibly healing for both of us because I realized that I can love you through a lot. <laughs> You know, that I can still choose you in your mess. And, mm. I, and I say to couples all the time, you can be blessed and in a mess. And, you know, it's so easy to choose your partner on the good days, on the days when everything's working. What really defines you is can you choose each other in the mess? Mm. Can you choose each other in the challenges? And how do you show up for each other in that mess and those challenges? Yeah. And yeah. that support I think is life changing mm. and that support alone can be so healing for both of you. And the thing to remember is no one knows what's going to happen next. So that was your tough time. Mm. But I also know that I could go through challenges in the future. And, you know, I want, there's a, you know, a lot of us can say like, I would want my partner sh to show up for me in this way. But then it's like, well, how do you show up for them mm. in challenges? Yeah. Um, and it is uncomfortable. But there, just because it's uncomfortable doesn't make it make it wrong. Yeah. It actually is a really incredible opportunity for growth, and I think that's what I chose to see it as. Yes, it was hard seeing you in that. There was tears. There was, mm. you know, tough conversations. There was. Um, it was really uncomfortable, but it was so incredibly healing for both of us. And I think in that we both realised that we can love each other as messy human beings and that love is actually deeper richer that's really the connection we're all craving mm. we are all craving to be seen in our mess and to still be loved you yeah. know it's it's so healing it and is. and i think that it it um opened the door like you said for more um more shifts and growth to happen and that's something else i wanted to mention i see a lot of women and I did the same thing initially after we had done these ceremonies for a year. I did get to a point where my ego was like, okay, well, what's he going to do next? You know, okay, we've had these conversations. It's been really yeah. great. We've had these deep chats. Okay, practically what's going to happen next? Mm. You know, because I wanted some things to change. And I found myself sometimes saying to Adam like, okay, so what are you going to do next? How how are you going to support yourself through mm. this? Um because I, again, I fell into that pattern of worrying about him and taking responsibility yeah. for what was going on for him, which was not helpful and I couldn't actually do. And Adam yeah. was really great at letting me know in those moments, I know you're scared, but I'm going to keep having these conversations with you. I'm now going to communicate how I'm feeling. I am going to keep taking the next steps. And so I just started to support you in those next steps. Instead of telling you what they should be or criticizing your progress or judging it, I just started to acknowledge the progress you were making, which made you want to take more progress. Yeah. And I had to trust. Mm. And this is so hard. There's a huge lesson in that. And especially for the women out there, I know you, you, you women are, you know, you want to grow and you want your partner to grow with you. And a lot of the time you have the best intentions, but trying to tell your man what to do is not the best strategy to get him to do what you want him to do. Um, that trust is what really um, allowed me to take responsibility and choose my own path and, and make the progress I made in a short period of time. When you are when you feel like you're being controlled or micromanaged or um, bossed around by your partner, for men, we shut down mm. and we actually do the opposite. So yeah, that was, that was really powerful. So yeah. should we dive into these five yes. steps for people? Yes, let's dive in. So this. step one is, Creating a safe space. Yeah, which we've talked about. We so. have touched on that already, but it is critical that you you have this conversation with your partner uh, and you create a safe space for them to really open up when they're ready. Yes. So not saying we're going to sit down and I really need you to tell me everything that's going on for you. That's <laughs> yeah. not the way to do it. But creating a, 
this can be in everyday moments. This mm -hmm. doesn't have to be like a time you sit down and you actually say, okay, well, now we're going to do X, Y, Z. Yeah, it's about checking in, creating yeah. intentional time to check in. Yeah. And, you know, the reason why we did it at night and did ceremonies is because we wanted to have a loving, safe, nurturing intention mm. around sharing. Yeah. So it doesn't have to look the same way as ours. Like a safe space is just a place that you both feel welcome, yeah. that you and and have some rules like we did. So no judging, no fixing, mm. no criticizing. Yeah. The goal is to actively listen and hold space for each other, which literally means to witness each other mm. in whatever is coming up and ask each other what you need. You know, um, sometimes Adam needed me to hold him and touch him while he was sharing so mm. that he didn't feel so exposed mm. um, or you know maybe he needed to journal sometimes you didn't even need to talk you yeah. just wanted to be in each other's presence and actually journal what we were feeling and then share it with yep. each other so just find your own way in it but it's about making open non-judgmental communication yep. easier yeah um, and actually more enjo enjoyable so that safe space is just that's it just creating a space where there is non-judgment where all of you is welcome. Mm. It will be a little bit uncomfortable because yeah. we are messy human beings. Um, yeah. But the more you can see that, that that there's blessings in that mess, you know, there's so much gold that gets to be shared when you want to actually see and understand your partner on a deeper level. Mm. And then you learn things about yourself as well. So um, that is is so powerful and if you're if you're struggling creating that for yourself get support yeah. work with a coach reach out to us um read a book there's so many tools out there now so many yeah. resources to help you to learn how to practice having um, a more intentional relationship and and how you can show up yeah. in your communication for each other yeah um, and if you want to know how we can support you guys there's, there's links down in the description if you're on youtube or if you're on the podcast again links down below um, where we can you can find out about how we can support you with that sort of side of things. So step two is emotional intelligence. So, and yeah. this is a huge issue for me. I didn't actually know what, what I was feeling. And, and that's what it essentially means. Emotional intelligence is having an understanding and intelligence of what's going on with your emotional body. Yeah. What are you feeling? And, and just being able to describe what those emotions are and then understand why you're feeling them. Like yeah. where have they come from? And then what's the next step you need to take? Do you just need to feel it or do you need to take some action? There's usually messages in those feelings and the more we can get familiar with what they are, it just makes life so much easier. Yeah, and then your partner can support you in it. Yeah. You know, like when you can articulate and communicate, this is what's going on for me right now. Like I know when Adam first was able to do that and he said to me, I just feel a bit lost. And I think you actually described it, like I just feel like I'm floating in the wind. Mm. Like. I actually felt so relieved when you said that, you know, he wasn't using the exact words of like, I'm feel, I've got anxiety and I'm feeling a bit depressed, which is kind of what was going on for you, but it didn't matter. Just describe it in whatever way you can. Yeah. Just sharing with your partner that you feel lost, that you feel like you're floating, that you feel like you've hit rock bottom, mm. all of these ways that you can describe it can help them support you in it. And as a partner, as a wife to someone who was experiencing that, I actually felt relieved when you shared those words with me because I knew then I wasn't crazy. Yeah. I knew then that what I intuitively was feeling was real. Mm. And the thing is, the truth will set you free. If, if someone, if you're not sharing the truth of how you're feeling, you can't move forward. Yeah. Yes, it's uncomfortable to say to your partner or to say to yourself, like, I feel like I'm, I'm at rock bottom or I feel like I'm lost. Mm. or I'm just in a really dark place. But the only way through it is through it. So you have to actually acknowledge it and name it and mm. say what it is in whatever way you can without judging yourself or each other. And then that's when the next steps will unfold. And that's what happened for us. Once you shared that with me, I think you had a sense of relief, I had a sense of mm. relief, and then we could make a plan and have a conversation and work out the next steps forward. Yeah. Um, and we could allow that journey to unfold. But if mm. you're not sharing it with someone you trust or you feel safe with, you can't actually move forward. Yeah. And, and you get stuck and consumed by it. 
Um, and that's really the hardest part. So yes, it can be hard to share and it can be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but it's also uncomfortable to hold it inside yeah. and pretend like you're okay when you're not okay. Mm. Um, so I think it's really important to to know that it doesn't matter how you say it, just get it out. Yeah. And and know that once you've shared it, that that then that path is going to be able to unfold mm. to, to keep you moving forward. But the truth will set you free. We must be real and honest with ourselves and each other to, to really move forward. Yeah, absolutely. So step three is self-love and self-care. So when you're, this is particularly for the person, well, it's for both partners really, depending mm. on who is dealing with the mental health issue, it doesn't really matter. You really need to give yourself and each other more self-love and self-care. Um, the only way you're gonna really identify, and I'll speak from my, from my experience, I really had to get more intimate and curious about what was going on for me and, um, and give myself some more space to feel what was coming up. Um, if you're super busy, like most of us are, with work and everything else going on in life, and you're not slowing down enough, you're not gonna be able to feel and process what's coming up. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's why we have a mental health crisis. Yeah throughout the world is because we're all way too busy doing things rather than being a human being. So there's a, yeah, there's a real and issue there. space to be with what is there. So, yeah. and you really did have a challenge with this. Adam was mm. very much addicted to doing yeah. and distracting. Yeah. Um, and, and obsessed with being in my mind all the time. Um, and what I mean by that is like working or watching a video or you know, interacting or learning or even reading books. Mm, just that, consuming, that's, It's consuming yeah. information and it doesn't give you space to really feel and process what's coming up. The only way to do that work is by being out in nature, meditating, yoga, journaling, yeah. talking to your partner or talking to a coach or a counsellor or someone. Yeah, creating, um, like, like we said, that safe space of the ceremonial cacao where yeah. we created space so yeah. that you could unpack what was going on for you. Yeah. And I say the word created, do not wait for this magical time to mm. appear in your day, your month, your year or your life. Yeah. It won't just happen. There is never a perfect, perfect time to have mm. mental health challenges no. or to have a conversation about it or deal with it. Yeah. We have to deal with it as, as it's arising and we need to normalise needing to take a day off work, yeah. needing to finish early, needing to, you know what, we're just having eggs on toast tonight because that's my capacity right now. Yeah. Because what I actually need to do is look after my mental health. Mm. And yeah. the more we can do that in the moments, the less it's going to stack up and be like this big, you know, breakdown. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's why a lot of people, I don't know whether you've recognised this or seen this, but I've noticed this in people, that where we take a holiday, we go on a holiday. Yeah. So we book a holiday and maybe it's a few months away. And then when we get to our holiday, we start to get sick. Mm. And then for our whole holiday, we've got a cold, or we've got the flu, or we've got some other thing. And then we come back and we're like, my holiday was shit i was yeah. sick the whole time that's because you've been suppressing the whole time you haven't mm -hmm. created the space enough self-love self-care to go through all of that stuff before you went on your holiday yes and so yeah it's really really important and yeah. le learning to do that was quite difficult especially as a man mm. it was quite difficult to learn well what does that even mean yeah well i like, remember actually... i thought i did love myself but then i realized no i actually don't because if i loved myself i would i would actually make time for myself to mm -hmm to journal and yeah. to do these things that would allow all this stuff to come up and it wouldn't be down under the surface with the lid on. Mm. It would all just be cut flowing through me and I wouldn't feel like this. Yeah, yeah. And I remember asking you that, do, do you actually love yourself? And you struggled to answer that question. Mm. And you even were like, what does that even mean? I don't, like, I don't even know what that means. Yeah. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, it just kind of broke my heart and made me feel sad that you yeah. didn't love yourself. And mm. then I think I asked you, do you make yourself happy? And you were like, I don't really know if I do. Mm. And that comes back to self-care and self-love. And they yeah. are questions you can mm. ask yourself and from a place of curiosity, not judgment. Yeah. But because I asked you those questions, you could then get curious about, okay, well, what does make me happy? What does bring me joy? Mm. Um, you know, when Adam was in that depressed place, he was not having fun. There was no fun, there was no light. Yep. Um, and so once I asked you these questions, I then got curious about what is fun to you? And that's when we actually 
talked about how Adam loved loved instruments and loved music. So I encouraged him to buy a didgeridoo and you yeah. actually made a didgeridoo and started to play it and mm. just that was so healing and that actually was a form of self-care for you yeah. um that you enjoyed running so then you started running and that became part of your self-care yeah. practice yeah. um and then it's continued to evolve you mentioned that you like guitar and i really supported you and encouraged you and suggested get a guitar yeah because why i'm sharing this is self-care does not always look like a bath time with yourself it's different to everybody you need to really yeah. dig deep and ask yourself these questions what brings me joy what did i do as a child that mm. really helped me feel alive yeah. and you know that i loved doing whether i was happy sad whatever mm. um and because i had this curiosity and asked you those questions it opened you to remember like i loved playing instruments and i have not done that for years mm. and just by bringing that back in it's been really healing and helpful for you and yeah. it's been a form of self-care. Definitely. Um, so, yeah. you know, when you think about self-care and self-love, think outside the box. It's not just the typical things that we see all the time. Yeah. Um, and the second part of this, like Adam said, is it was really important that I took care of myself because it takes a lot of energy mm. and emotional capacity to support someone else through their challenges. and. I was more resourced at that time. And we say this to couples all the time. You know, women say to me, it's so frustrating. I feel like I'm carrying the load and I have to help him and I have to do all these things. And I'm here to say, you don't have to do anything. Mm. It's a choice. And it was a choice I decided to make because I was more resourced. Mm. I had been doing the work a bit longer than Adam. So I got used to dealing with my emotions and regulating them. I had some tools and self-care practices that were supporting me. Um, I did love myself. I still do love myself. I'm, I'm not perfect, but I had already been on that journey of, mm. you know, that journey of loving myself, learning to love myself in all of it. So I was at a stage where at that point I was more resourced than Adam. Yeah. So, and I feel like relationships are, are about growth. And so to me, it's a commitment to the good, the bad, the ugly, yeah. and how can we grow through it together? So mm. At that time, I was more resourced, but I will mention that I did increase my level of self-love and self-care. I had coaches um, to support me. I was in sister circles. I was ma making sure that my needs were being met yeah. because you didn't have the capacity at that time to meet them. Yeah. So I think that's the key. It does not mean you self-sacrificing <laughs> or people-pleasing or anything like that because yeah. if you get in the trenches with them, that's not helpful and i did that in the past and it didn't work out well mm. you have to stay out of the trenches but to support them by keeping your self-care and your self-love high yeah. so that you can raise them up and yeah. you can really pull them out of it i think that's really important absolutely to mention. so step four get support so we've already really touched on that but yeah, it's really important my, my first step was to get a coach but it doesn't really matter what it is just something it could be your partner but a lot of the time we find that your partner is probably not the best person to support you because there's there'll be some pattern there there'll be some yeah, yeah. it depends how much work your partner has done yeah if they have been doing the work yeah. and they're um you know i was already they have the capacity like we just spoke about and yeah. um, which aston did at that time it was a stretch but she was able to support me um but then i did need to get another coach um who was a man for me and that was really helpful but whatever it is, just find someone or something that can support you. Maybe it's a men's group. Maybe it's a women's circle. Um, maybe it's a book. Maybe, maybe it's, a, it's book. a program. It's an online you know, course. Maybe yep. it's reaching out to us and yep. seeing how we can support you. But just open your mind 